Hi, this is Roger Marsh for Family Talk. With Valentine's Day this week, we want to know, how romantic are you? Go now to drjamesdobson.org and take our romance quiz. Now, this is a fun activity. It's going to show you just how much you adore your spouse. After you're finished, we will email you a copy of Dr. Dobson's five romance tips as well. So hurry over to drjamesdobson.org and take our Valentine's Day quiz and recapture the romance in your relationship. Today on Family Talk. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. James Dobson, and this is a radio ministry of the James Dobson Family Institute. Today, I'm going to do something a little different than in the past. I have no guests or telephone hookups uh, with us today. Instead, I want to read something to you. Now, I rarely do that, but I do write a letter, a monthly letter, that we send out to a large number of people whose names are on our mailing list. And I've written those letters almost every month since 1980. I've been at this a long time. And sometimes I feel more strongly about my message than others. And what you're about to hear is one that means a great deal to me. I hope it will also mean something to you. With that, let me take a run at it. Dear friends, February 14th is a day that's set aside each year to celebrate love. Traditionally, it occurs when a man pauses to express his love and appreciation for the woman he cherishes romantically. Today, I want to focus on Valentine's Day and expand it to consider the institution of marriage itself and what it means for the well-being of our culture. Now, marriage is one of the Creator's most marvelous and enduring gifts to humankind. This divine plan was revealed to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and then described succinctly in Genesis 2.24, where we read, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. With those 22 words, God announced the ordination of the family long before he established the two other great human institutions, the church and the government. More than 5,000 years have come and gone since that point of origin, yet every civilization in the history of the world has been built upon it. Despite today's skeptics who claim that marriage is an outmoded and narrow-minded Christian concoction, the desire of men and women to leave and cleave has survived and thrived through times of prosperity, famine, wars, peace, epidemics, and every other possible circumstance and condition. It has been the bedrock of culture in Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, South America, Australia, and even the Arctic. Given this history, one might begin to suspect that something mystical within human nature must be drawing the sexes together, not just for purposes of reproduction as with animals, but to satisfy an inexpressible longing for spiritual bonding. Indeed, how can that be doubted? Clearly, our loving Creator placed a desire for intimacy and companionship deep within men and women and called their love for each other one flesh. Admittedly, there have been periods in history where homosexuality has flourished, including the biblical cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and others in ancient Greece and the Roman Empire. None of these civilizations survived. Furthermore, even where sexual perversion was tolerated, the institution of marriage continued to be honored in law and culture. Only in the last few years has what is now referred to as gay marriage been given equal status with biblical male-female unions. The impact of that vast sociological experiment is no longer speculative. 
We can see where that leads by observing what happened in Scandinavian nations, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, when the leaders were the first to embrace de facto marriages between homosexuals. This was in the 1990s. The consequence for traditional families were devastating. The institution of marriage in those countries began dying with most young couples cohabiting or choosing to remain single. More than 80% of children in some areas in Norway were and continued to be born out of wedlock. It appears that tampering with the ancient plan for males and females spells eventual doom for the family and everything related to it. We're now seeing the disintegration of marriage on a large scale, along with the alarming descent of the birth rate in most Western nations. Indeed, everything related to family has fallen on hard times. This spells bad news for the stability of entire cultures. One of the reasons the preservation of the family is critical to the health of nations is the enormous influence the sexes have on each other. They are specifically designed to fit together, both physically and emotionally, and neither is entirely comfortable without the other. There are exceptions, of course, but this is the norm. George Gilder, the brilliant sociologist and author of the book Men and Marriage, states that women hold the key to the stability and productivity of men. When a wife believes in her husband and deeply respects him, he gains the confidence necessary to compete successfully and live responsibly. She gives him a reason to harness his masculine energy, to build a home, to obtain and keep a job, to help her raise their children, to remain sober, to live within the law, to spend money wisely, etc., Without a positive feminine influence, his tendency is to release the power of testosterone in a way that's destructive to himself and to society at large. We see Gilder's insight played out in the inner city. Our welfare system in the aftermath of great society programs rendered men more or less unnecessary. Indeed, government assistance to women and children was reduced or denied when a father was present in the home. Food stamps put groceries in the pantry. The Department of Housing and Urban Development sent repairmen to address maintenance problems. When children were in trouble, social workers stepped in to help. Thus, men became unnecessary beyond the act of impregnation. Who needed them? Gilder contends that this disengagement of men from women and their children explains why drug abuse, alcoholism, crime, and absentee fathers have become rampant in the inner city. Men were separated from their historic role as providers and protectors, which stripped them of masculine dignity and robbed them of meaning and purpose. Thus, as Gilder said, Their energy became a destructive force instead of empowering growth and personal development. Stated positively, men have a deep-seated need for women, which is why the bonding that occurs between the sexes is so important to society as a whole. Successful marriages have a civilizing influence on men, and that is not only in the best interest of women— but is vital for the protection and welfare of children. Just as men are dependent upon women for stability, women, for their part, have deep longings for romantic fulfillment that can best be satisfied by a committed relationship with a man. Their sense of self-worth, contentment, and fulfillment are typically derived, at least in part, from heart-to-heart intimacy in marriage. Unfortunately, most young husbands find these emotional needs in their wives to be not only confusing, but downright baffling at times. This was certainly true of my early relationship with my wife, Shirley. It took me several years after we were married before I began to get it. 
We experienced some bumps in the road while I was getting things sorted out. The most eye-opening encounter between us occurred on our first Valentine's Day together, six months after we were married. You could call it one of my biggest mistakes. I had gone to the USC library that morning and spent eight to ten hours poring over dusty books and journals. I had completely forgotten that it was February 14th. What was worse, I was oblivious to the preparations that were going on at home. Shirley had cooked a wonderful dinner, baked a pink heart-shaped cake with Happy Valentine's Day written on the top. She placed red candles on the table, wrapped a small gift that she had bought for me, and then she wrote a little love note on the greeting card. The stage was set. She would meet me at the front door with a kiss and a hug. But there I sat on the other side of Los Angeles, blissfully unaware of the storm that was gathering overhead. About 8 p.m., I was hungry, and I ordered a hamburger at the University Grill. After eating, I moseyed out to where my Volkswagen was parked, and I headed toward home. Then I made a terrible mistake, and I would regret it for many moons. I stopped by to see my parents, who lived near the freeway. Mom greeted me warmly and served up a great slice of apple pie. That sealed my doom. When I finally put my key in the lock at 10 p.m., I knew instantly that something was horribly wrong. The apartment was almost dark, and all was deathly quiet. Shirley was in bed with the covers pulled around her head. On the table was a coagulated dinner, still sitting in our best dishes and bowls. Half-burned candles stood cold and dark in their silver-plated holders. It appeared that I had forgotten something important. But what, I thought. Then I noticed the red and white decorations on the table, and I thought to myself, oh, no. So there I stood in the semi-darkness of our little living room, feeling like a jerk. I didn't even have a card, much less a thoughtful gift for Shirley. No romantic thoughts had crossed my mind all day. I couldn't even pretend to want the dried-out food that sat before me. After a brief flurry of words and a few tears, Shirley went back to bed, and her hurt and disappointment were impossible to miss. I would have given a thousand dollars for a true, plausible explanation for where I'd been. There just wasn't one. It didn't help me to tell her. I stopped by to see my parents, and I ate a piece of great apple pie. It was wonderful. You should have been there. <laughs> Fortunately, Shirley is not only a romantic lady, but she is a forgiving one, too. We talked about my thoughtlessness later that night and came to an understanding. I learned a big lesson on that Valentine's Day, and I determined never to forget it. I'll bet, however, that I'm not the only brute who has underestimated the importance of February 14th. There must be several million guys out there who can identify with my oversight. Now, once I learned more about how my wife differed from me, especially with regard to romantic matters, I began to get with the program. One day I came home from work and asked Shirley to join me for a date that I call Old Haunts. I took her to many of the places we had visited when we were dating in college. We walked through the farmer's market and then ate pizza at Michelli's Italian restaurant in Los Angeles, where I'd taken this beautiful girl on our first date. We drove by the Pasadena Playhouse, where we had seen a theater performance on our second date. Then we strolled along, hand in hand, reminiscing about times gone by. It was a wonderful afternoon and evening together, and I assure you, Shirley loved it. What I was beginning to understand in those early days were the ways my wife was uniquely crafted and how I alone could meet her most important emotional needs. Shirley was also learning some things about me. She observed that I needed her to respect me and to believe in me 
and to listen to my hopes and dreams. Shirley said all the right things, not because she was trying to manipulate me, but because she clearly believed them. She would often tell me, I am so proud of you, and I'm glad to be part of your team. It's going to be exciting to see what God will do with us in the days ahead. The way she looked up to me gave me confidence as a student who had never really accomplished anything to that point. It empowered me to take risks professionally and to reach for the sky. She was meeting a critical need in me, precisely in the way George Gilder described. I was then motivated to give Shirley what she needed from me. We have now been married for more than 58 years, and it's been a great ride. I can't imagine life without her, and I'm thankful that she feels the same about me. I know marriage doesn't always work that successfully, but that's the way it's designed to be. When the prominent needs of one sex go unmet or ignored in the other, something akin to soul hunger occurs, primarily in women. It cannot be explained by cultural influences that were learned in childhood, as important as they are. There's something more fundamental that is deeply rooted in the human personality. That observation was confirmed for me time and again in my professional work as a psychologist, where I've observed those same patterns in couples with whom I've counseled. There is a divine plan in human nature that suits men and women for one another. In short, marriage, when it functions as intended, is good for everyone, for men and women and children, for the community, the nation, and the world. Those who are gay or lesbian have a right to commit to one another in any way they choose, but their relationship is a form of counterfeit marriage. Research shows consistently that heterosexual married adults do better in virtually every measure of emotional and physical health than people who are divorced or never married. They live longer. They have happier lives. They recover from their illnesses more quickly. They earn and save more money. They're more reliable employees. They suffer less stress and they are less likely to become victims of violence. They find the job of parenting more enjoyable, and they have more satisfying and fulfilling sex lives. These and countless other benefits of marriage serve to validate the wisdom of the Creator who told us what was best for humankind. He said in the book of Genesis, it's not good for the man to be alone. So he made Adam a helpmeet a partner of the opposite sex, a lover, and then commanded them to be fruitful and multiply, have children, repopulate the earth. What a great plan. We will depart from it at our peril. This is why I'm deeply concerned today about the effort to tamper with this time-honored institution for nearly 60 years, the homosexual activist movement and related entities have been working to implement a master plan that has as its centerpiece the weakening or destruction of the family. Now the final battle is at hand. The institution of marriage, along with an often weakened and impotent church, is all that stands in the way of achievement of every coveted aspiration. These goals include universal acceptance of the gay lifestyle, the discrediting of scripture that condemn homosexuality, muzzling of the clergy and Christian media, granting of special privileges and rights in the law, overturning laws prohibiting pedophilia and the indoctrination of children and future generations through public education. Legalized pedophilia and polygamy could be around the corner. Now, these radical objectives that seemed unthinkable just a few years ago have largely been achieved or are now within reach. All that remains is for the LGBTQ movement 
and its friends in the media, the entertainment industry, the professions, the government, the universities, and the military, to deliver a coup de grace to a beleaguered institution, the family. Those of us in North America and Europe are not simply slouching toward Gomorrah, as Judge Robert Bork warned in his best-selling book. We are hurtling toward it. I believe we can still turn the tide, but it won't be easy. The majority of Americans want marriage to survive, but we will need a moral and spiritual awakening from the cultural miasma into which we have sunk, and we need it now. In conclusion, let me tell you why I have chosen to address again the welfare of marriage and the family. It is hardly no new theme for me. My story goes back more than four decades when I was a young professor engaged in very rewarding and exciting research. I could have been entirely happy working in academia for many years, perhaps the rest of my life. At that time, however, I became increasingly alarmed by what I saw happening to my country. The fabric of American life was unraveling under pressure from social engineers who had a radically different design for parents and their children. These revolutionaries seemed to be everywhere after the upheaval of the 1960s. They insisted that America needed to be fundamentally transformed. That was long before Barack Obama preached this same message during his first presidential campaign. Neither he nor the liberal community has explained to us why anyone would want to transform the most successful nation in the history of the world. We now know it had everything to do with socialism, wealth and power, the sexual revolution, and hostility toward historic biblical teachings. I opposed every aspect of that movement then and what it has become. I wrote about it in my first book, Dare to Discipline, which is still in print today. Going back to 1977, I began to hear a new calling. It urged me to do what I could to help strengthen and preserve the institutions of marriage and parenting. I resigned from the university and started the work that continues with vigor today. It is called James Dobson Family Institute, JDFI, and it's still our raison d'etre, our reason for being. You and millions of other generous people have identified with this cause and have supported it for many years. What we're doing at JDFI now is more desperately needed than ever before. It is heartbreaking to see what public schools in liberal states are doing to children as young as kindergarten age. Can you imagine middle school boys and girls showering together at school? And as we have seen, marriage is on the ropes and biblical morality is being mocked and undermined. My last paragraph. These are the issues plus the sanctity of human life that drive us today. I can tell you how much I appreciate your standing with us. Our board is busily redesigning the ministry so that it will continue long after my time on this earth. And you can be sure that the battle to save the family will need all the help it can get as the civil war of values heats up. We must pray for it and for the young parents who are struggling to raise children today in a shockwave world. Thank you so much for taking this journey with us and blessings to you all. And I hope you will join us tomorrow. James Dobson, founder, James Dobson Family Institute. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hello everyone, Roger Marsh here for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. 
The news comes in all shapes, sizes, and formats these days, but how do you cut through all the noise and get to the heart of the matters that affect your family? Well, come to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk and sign up for Dr. Dobson's monthly newsletter. You'll find clarity on tough issues, encouragement for daily life, and trusted principles to help you build strong, healthy, and connected families. Go to drjamesdobson.org and sign up today. That's drjamesdobson.org. This is Dr. Tim Clinton. Thank you for tuning in today for this edition of Family Talk. Every day we strive to bring you programs that will help strengthen your family. And to do this, we need your help. We need your prayers. We also need your financial contributions. You know that Dr. Dobson has been fighting for the family for over 40 years now, and he's not about to stop, believe you me. Here's Roger Marsh with more information on how you can support the ministry of Family Talk. And friend, thanks to generous listeners like you, Family Talk can reach more and more listeners with practical help and encouragement. To support Family Talk with your best gift, go online to drjamesdobson.org or call 877-732-6825.